DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents Begin Again, The Spiritual Legacy of Venerable Bruno Lanteri with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher was ordained in 1979 as a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. He obtained his doctorate from the Gregorian University, and he has dedicated many years to an extensive ministry of retreats, spiritual direction, and teachings about the spiritual life. Father Gallagher is the author of several books published by the Crossroads Publishing Company on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the life of Venerable Bruno Lanteri. Father Gallagher is featured on the EWTN series, Living the Discerning Life, the Spiritual Teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Begin again, the spiritual legacy of Venerable Bruno Lanteri with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Gallagher. Thank you, Chris. What a unique opportunity to be able to learn more about Venerable Bruno Lanteri when we have the opportunity to look at his actual letters of spiritual direction. And in this case, in our conversation, we'll be discussing letters he sent to a woman named Gabriella. Gabriella was one of the, the many laymen and women whom he directed spiritually in the course of his life. A striking instance of this, we actually only have three of the letters of spiritual direction that he wrote to her. The way that he did this, because she lived at a little distance from Turin where he lived, was that as he was able, periodically from time to time, he would visit with the uh, with the family and have a chance to meet Gabriella. But most of it would have been done by letters. She would write to him, and then he would respond. Now, understandably, we don't have any of her letters to him. Uh, Wanting to respect the confidentiality of spiritual direction, he would certainly have destroyed not only her letters, but any letters of spiritual direction that were written to him. But the people who received his letters were free to keep them, and uh, a number of them did. And when a few years after Venerable Lanteri's death, his oblates began gathering information about his life with a view toward a process of canonization, they asked those whom they knew uh, he had guided spiritually if they had any of his letters that they would be willing to to uh, send back for the archive for that cause of canonization. And at that time, it was uh, Gabriella's daughter-in-law who looked through her mother-in-law's papers and found just three of these letters. And so these are the three that we have, together with another small sheet on which Gabriella had just noted some of the things that the Venerable Anteri had said in conversation with her. So these were not written, but things that he'd said verbally to her in conversation. So that's what we have. She was um, married at a young age, widowed when still quite young, and then uh, not long after remarried. And this was her lifelong marriage, from which she had six children, four boys and two girls. Now, Uh, in keeping with what was quite frequent in those days of high infant mortality, when medicine had not yet reached its present level, three of her four boys died at a very early age. We can think back to what we said about Venerable Anteri's own family, in which he was the seventh of ten, five of whom died uh, also at a very early age. The one surviving son uh, went on to a very distinguished career political career in the nation of Piedmont, which was on its way toward becoming, expanding into the kingdom of Italy that it would eventually become. And he held for a number of years in that government the position of Minister of Foreign Affairs, which would be the equivalent, roughly, of our Secretary of State today. And he remains a a figure who is well known in the history of Italy during those years, and was strikingly Uh, known by all to be a very strong Catholic in the midst of a political context that was becoming increasingly hostile to the church. In all likelihood, he himself as a young man was directed spiritually by the Venerable Anteri. In all likelihood, he was one of the many young men and young women who would have responsible positions in the culture of uh, their nation who were directed by Venerable Anteri, and there are a number of reasons why that uh, seems very likely to have been the case. Certainly, he adhered very strongly to 
the Holy Father had a great love for his faith and for the church in a way that characterized all of those who were guided by Venerable Ann Terry. But he himself said and told the Oblates in uh, later years after Venerable Ann Terry's death, it was because of the way his mother raised him and he knew that the guidance, the spiritual guidance that she needed to raise her family well, she found through the Venerable Ann Terry. So, this is just one instance of many which will always remain hidden in which we can see something of the impact of the kind of spiritual direction that the Venerable Ann Terry offered. Of the two daughters, one married and one became a religious woman. So this, this is the background, that's the setting of these three letters of spiritual direction. It is so interesting when we look at the lives of faithful people, and often even in the lives of the saints, that it is because of the spiritual spiritual heritage that has been passed on to them by their parents and their grandparents sometimes as well, that it, it really does make a difference, doesn't it, Father Gallagher? It's the decisive difference, and, um, and that's why the Church always repeats that the primary educators of their children are the parents. The schools and, and all the other institutions can help, but the primary educators always are the parents. And when the parents are themselves helped spiritually in the way that they need to not only remain faithful, but to be growing in a life of prayer and holiness and understanding of their faith and participation in the life of the church, when they are receiving the help that they need to do that, then they are helped to become the kind of parents whose children can live the kinds of lives that Gabriella's three children did, her son and her two daughters. So the, the quiet accompaniment of spiritual direction, of not being alone in the spiritual life, in the various ways in which that's available to us, as we've said in other conversations, makes all the difference in helping a parent to be that kind of parent whose children will be that kind of children. What a gift these letters are. You know, I, I think of those other letters from different spiritual lighthouses for us. So when I think of St. Francis de Sales, St. Jane de Chantal, their communication back and forth. This is a period where letter writing and spiritual direction seem to be an integral way of communicating because people were separated by distance often in, in many cases. I think we take that for granted given our, our modern means of communication and the ability to be able to jump into a car and, and travel somewhere. Well, I remember that when I was a seminarian over in Rome, how much we all, I and my fellow seminarians, we all waited for the mail to come every day. It was an event. And if you got a letter from home or from a friend, it made such a difference in your heart and was so strengthening in so many ways. And that same dynamic worked very uh, really on the spiritual level. And so you have people like the saints, the saints that you've mentioned, St. Ignatius of Loyola uh, wrote at least 7,000 letters that we have conserved, probably wrote a good many more, of this kind of spiritual direction. So this was, this was a, a, a very important way for people to share their spiritual needs and then to receive the kind of personalized spiritual advice which made all the difference in their lives. And, and you can certainly see it in these letters that uh, we're discussing now. I'm, I'm looking at the first of them now as uh, we're speaking. And I noticed that uh, what the Venerable Ann Terry does is he, he starts on the human level. Firstly, he just tells Gabriella that her latest letter to him was uh, a source of real joy to him. And then he lets her know that he's happy that she's returned safely from a trip. So there's been some kind of trip in the family and it's gone well. He's happy to know from her that all are in good health in the family. And then we don't have the details, but she has evidently asked Venerable Bruno's advice about a little young Louise, who is not one of her daughters, but some kind of a family member. And the question was whether it would be good for Louise to spend some time with Gabriella's sister and her family. And the Venerable Aunt Terry writes to Gabriella that he sees no reason why this couldn't be a good thing, that Louise will be in very good hands. And, and so he says, 
Uh, as far as I can see, you can do this with total peace of heart. And having spoken then about family issues, he turns to where his heart always goes. And where this is where most of the four paragraphs of this letter goes. And that is to spiritual things, to the practices of the spiritual life and how things are going for Gabriella in this regard. Now, I'm, I'm just going to run through the different things that he advises her to do. And I think you'll see, Chris, that this will be a concrete instance of the kinds of things we've been talking about throughout these conversations. He's remarkably consistent in the spiritual program that he suggests to these men and women, in this case, laymen and women. Now, he's heard that there's a priest in the area there and is delighted about that because what it means is that Mass is going to be available to Gabriella. And so he says, it's, it's very important, start immediately, begin immediately to um, be in touch with him and to see about receiving communion and to do that as often as you can. Um, so that's the first thing uh, that's in his heart is, is the Eucharist and, and Mass and receiving communion. And asks this mother of six children with a household and a family and the rest to try to receive communion as often as she can, to get to Mass and receive communion. We would... Uh, We're not surprised at this point that he then turns to meditation, and he asks her to be faithful to that, as much as possible to be faithful to 15 minutes of meditation at least a day, and then to spiritual reading. And this is where he says something I've quoted elsewhere. If if all she can read is to read just one page, let let Gabriella try to do that every day. So we have Mass as often as she can in Communion. 15 minutes of meditation in the course of the day, and then at least one page from a book of spiritual reading. Then he asks her to try to make the examination of conscience every day. We've talked about this at length in another setting in its contemporary rendering as the examine prayer. But uh, to try to do this, he says, um, which you can do it even while you're working. In that situation in which your hands are going to be busy at some kind of work, but your heart and your mind can be free to be in communion and in prayer, and with the Lord to review the spiritual experience of the day. Is there something for which I need to ask God's forgiveness? Let me ask his forgiveness and seek to renew and do better for the future. And then, apart from these specific moments of prayer in the course of the day, none of which are impossible. There's not an awful lot of time that needs to go into this, but these moments, if she's faithful to them, will punctuate the day with prayer. Together with this, he asks her to try to lift up her heart frequently to God in the course of the day. And he asks her to try to do this with tenderness and peace, so that her communion with God is not only in the formal times of prayer that he's just described, but it's something that flows out of those and spills over into the entirety of the day. Um, So that she's just lifting up her heart silently, briefly, but often in the course of the day to God. Then he mentions mortification. uh, So that we're not driven simply by the desires of the moment, but that we're able to live with this human heart and our physical humanity in a way which is always as best as our human frailty can do it, but is consciously seeking to always be in harmony with God, always ordered toward God. Now, it's interesting that when he speaks of mortification to Gabriela, he doesn't speak as we might expect of mortification, exterior mortification, as it'd be called, uh, with regard to to eating or with regard to um, comfort and various things of this kind. But he especially urges her to interior mortification. And then he tells Gabriella that for you, that is a mortification of the heart, a discipline of the heart, so that our hearts stay constantly in harmony with God. He he tells Gabriella that for you, This means the effort to live each moment with a gentle and a joyful spirit. Now, it's quite possible 
that the reason he invites Gabriella to try day by day to live the day with the gentleness of Christ and the the warm joy of the Lord Jesus. Because Gabriella was, she was a very capable woman. Her situation was not easy. The um, During the occupation by the French, the family property and the family home had been taken over by the French and used for their purposes. It had been almost completely destroyed. So that when they were able, after the fall of Napoleon, to finally return to the, the family seat, everything had to be done. And Gabriella, who was a good administrator, wound up carrying the brunt of basically putting the, the, the financial situation of the family in order. But her husband, who was less skilled and less than Gabriella and less attentive to these kinds of things, simply left most of this to Gabriella. She was of a temperament that was capable. She was a good, as I said, a good administrator. Um, but she could, she could tend to be impatient or sharp. So perhaps somewhat by temperament, but also because the circumstances were such that you could easily see why, why anyone could tend to become impatient or, or sharp when such a, a burden is, is placed upon her without too much help. This was her struggle. Now, I think we can easily remember how we've mentioned before that in some ways this was Venerable Bruno's struggle as well, to try to live with the gentleness of the Lord Jesus. And here he urges her to try. This is her mortification. When you feel the the stirrings of impatience and a sharp word is right there on your lips, strive throughout the day to that interior mortification which contains those impulses and seeking God's help changes those into the gentleness and the joy of the Lord Jesus. And then, you can just see this one coming. He says to her, For the love of God, do not forget to resist constantly a displeasing frame of mind, that is, that impatient frame of mind, and never cease to begin again at all times. We only have three letters of spiritual direction of Venerable Bruno to Gabriella, plus, um, as I mentioned, a little sheet in which she jotted down some things he said verbally. But three times in these brief texts, he repeats this to her to, to begin again at all times. We'll return to Begin Again with Father Timothy Gallagher in just a moment. Discerning Hearts is a spiritual retreat stop for those who travel on the digital sea. Archbishop George Lucas of Omaha has said that Discerning Hearts is a trusted resource for Catholic spirituality and teaching. He supports it as an apostolate for the new evangelization that brings the good news to every corner of the world. Discerning Hearts is an official 501c3 nonprofit apostolate. It creates engaging multimedia specializing in audio productions known as podcasts and radio broadcasts, faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. By visiting the website discerninghearts.com or obtaining the free apps that are available for Android phones, iPhones, and iPads, Listeners have available to them the best of teachings from Archbishop George Lucas, Father Timothy Gallagher, Deacon James Keating, Dr. Anthony Lillis, Dr. Matthew Bunsen, Monsignor John Essif, Joseph Pierce, Mike Aquilina, Omar Gutierrez, Teresa Monahan, Sharon Doran, and so many others, as well as all the episodes from Inside the Pages with Chris McGregor. And there, too, you'll find devotionals of every kind, to listen to and enter into prayer with, like the Holy Rosary of Our Lady, the Stations of the Cross, the Chaplet of St. Michael, the Seven Sorrows of Our Lady, and countless others. For many around the world, Discerning Hearts is a daily source of inspiration, spiritual nourishment, and encouragement. The world is looking for answers, for spiritual guidance and authentic discernment, for relationship and community. Please keep the work of Discerning Hearts in your prayers and be sure to visit discerninghearts.com. <music> 
of this communication between the director and his directee that for Gabriella, it sounds as though a mortification, and a lot of times when we think of mortification, I think many of us think that it would involve a suffering, that it would actually be a suffering sometimes to have that gentle and joyful spirit that it sometimes is an act of the will. And for uh, Venerable Bruno Lanteri to direct this particular heart that he's guiding to do this, he he does it with a, a degree of tenderness, even in the written letter. That, I mean, he still allows her to um, maintain her dignity because it sounds as though that she had maybe um, a temperament that was a little bit more on the fiery side. Yes, that seems to have been the case. No one ever doubted in the, the witnesses that we have all recognized the, the deep goodness in this woman, but also recognize that um, she did have a fiery temperament, which was a great blessing in facing difficulties and overcoming hurdles uh, in the way that she needed to, to deal with situation that arose in the family's life, but could also trip her up into a sharpness that was not something that she tr- she certainly really wanted and certainly not something that the Lord wants uh, as we live his teaching in the world. But you you pick up so well, Chris, on the fact that Venerable Lanteri is never hard on her, is never forcing her to face her failure in such a way that it leaves her discouraged. And the reason why he never does this is because, as he will say tirelessly, God is not that way. Whenever we failed and sinned and we've fallen again into the same weakness and things have gone badly and we, and we, we seem caught in this and never seem to able ever to make any, any progress, precisely then, he says, God is the kind of Father who, who loves to come closer to us at such times, who awaits only the, the slightest but sincere turning of our heart toward him and immediately gives forgiveness and pours out the love and the grace that allow us to change and to grow. Because his own experience of God is so deeply that, he mirrors that, I think almost unconsciously, as he uh, relates to others in spiritual direction. He can be very very forthright, almost blunt at times, very clear in what he says, but it's always encouraging. It always leaves the person with hope. And you can see that sensitivity as he's dealing with uh, Gabriella here, as you picked up so well on that. Now, I'd say right along those lines, he finally he concludes this by saying to her, you don't have to wait until you're holy to do this. In, in the language of the time, he says, you don't have to wait until you have devotion to begin all of this. In our language today, we might use that language, but we might also speak of having achieved a certain closeness with God or communion with God or holiness. We can do all of this, that program of spiritual life that he's described even when we don't feel a great warmth of devotion in our hearts, even when we, when we don't feel like our lives are yet at least deep lives of holiness, even when we're so aware, as Gabriella certainly was, as the letter reveals, of our own failings and limitations, and we seem so far from the kind of sanctity that we read about in the lives of holy men and women, and to which the Church tells us that we're all called. Precisely when we don't yet feel that kind of devotion or holiness, Bruno Lanteri will will say to us, don't wait. Begin even without feeling that kind of holiness. Begin even without feeling that kind of devotion. Because that kind of devotion and warmth and closeness with God will come with time. And it's precisely doing these kinds of spiritual actions that, as he tells her, is the means toward acquiring that kind of devotion. That devotion is not the cause of these practices, but the effect of these practices. So that's, that's. then there are some concluding lines on a more practical note, but that's the heart of the spiritual message that he shares with Gabriella in this first of the letters. It, it is so telling that, again, it is about an act of the will, that it, even like when we have fallen, that you continue to get up keep going and practice those disciplines. He seems to see that as the light out of uh, the dark forest. And there's never anything that can ever stop us from doing that. 
And that's the beauty of it. That That's this, the whole message of Begin Again, which is a powerful thing. I know I've mentioned before how I am struck by, uh, as people reflect back to me having read the biography with that title, Begin Again, how much that single title itself really means to people. The spiritual doors are always open. And I suspect that it's this almost more than anything else that made so many men and women turn toward the Venerable Ann Terry for spiritual guidance. Certainly he was wise. He could tailor the spiritual life to the individual needs of the person. He could offer very concrete and helpful advice. But underlying it all, running through it all, was always this message. The spiritual doors are always open. Don't ever be discouraged. Don't ever remain caught in your discouragement. You don't need to remain caught in your discouragement. In fact, the very failures themselves, even the very sins themselves, if we simply turn our heart back to God, become sources of an even deeper conversion, an even deeper communion with the Lord. As the Lord delights in granting us forgiveness, as we become more rooted in in a rich gospel humility, which is not the same thing as an abasement, which is an emotional a negative emotion, but a rich gospel humility like Mary, who delights that God looks upon the lowest state of his handmaid, and then awakens new energy to take new steps so that we can always begin again. You've been listening to Begin Again, the spiritual legacy of Venerable Bruno Lanteri with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Begin Again, the spiritual legacy of Venerable Bruno Lanteri with Father Timothy Gallagher.